I'd like to welcome you to Calvary Chapel. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we are, we are glad you're here. If you come with a friend or family member, man, we're, we just want to welcome you. Just want you to know that we're, um, we're excited that you come to worship the Lord with us. We're taking a little different path this morning. We're diverting. We're, we'll get back to the Gospel of Luke next week. We're in, the, we're in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to encourage you, read ahead. We're, we're going to be looking at the resurrection next week, and, and we'll be wrapping up Luke chapter 24 in the next few weeks, and then we're going to begin uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to be looking at another incredible, incredible um, epistle, just really relative... Uh, relevant to to what our world is facing today and so we'll, we'll be we'll be journeying there next and so just to give you a heads up if you want to like read ahead I'd love for you to do that um at the beginning of the year I, I like to kind of just share the heart of Calvary Chapel Rio Grande Valley with you I think it's it's important for us to know kind of where we've been and then where we're going and just can being able to to kind of just have a picture of, of what God is what God has done and then and then what does God want to do you know and I, I just really it's going to be a different kind of study this morning I, I, it's going to be more of uh, sharing the core values of our church really sharing um, what God has done um, over the last years and so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take a little a little journey backwards first it was back in 1987 that I got radically saved. I, I was addicted to drugs, alcohol, partying, um, pretty much was, was a daily occurrence. It, it, was, it was all about the high, and, and um, God radically changed my life, man. He radically changed my life. And one of the things that I remember is that when God came in and he spoke to my heart, it was, in, it was in a Bible study. I was kind of just like we're gathering here. And I remember hearing God's word and God's word just, just penetrating my heart. And that, that evening, it was a Wednesday night, I remember it. it was that evening, man, I finally said, God, I give. For the next four years, I began to prepare because I knew God had, had a calling on my life. God had a call on my life when I was a little boy. I remember people, my mom was very much in, into, into the church. She was very much uh, going to many different churches. And the new, next door neighbors were also, the, the next door neighbors when I was about 12 years old prayed over me and they said, God is gonna use you. And he's gonna, he's gonna uh, you're gonna be a pastor. You're gonna be, you're gonna have, you're gonna be a shepherd over a large flock. At 12 years old, and I thought, man, these people are crazy, right? There's no way. And then, you know, I went down the whole party scene and everything. And then, but, but I remember when I got saved, I just knew, man, that God has something for my life. And so I started to go to Bible college. And I started to study and to see, God, what do you, what do you want to do with me? And then about six months after getting saved, I had a burden to move back to Belen. I was born in Belen, but I was raised in Southern California. And I had a burden for the Rio Grande Valley. And I, I remember going to sleep at night and I didn't know what was going on. I remember God would begin to just break my heart for this valley. I'd weep at night. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was losing my mind because I began to cry for all my family and for this whole community that God would do something here. I wanted God to send somebody, and I didn't know it was going to be me, because <laughs> I never wanted to move to Berlin. I, 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 you see, we used to come here as, when I was a kid, all my aunts and uncles and grandma and everybody was here, and we would come to visit, and I would remember leaving going, why would anybody live in Berlin? <laughs> that was how I walked away as a kid. But then I remember, man, as God spoke to me, you're going to be going there, man. I began to prepare, and I began to, you know, start, start to... Um, uh, plan on how we meet. I just got married. We, me and my, my wife, Marguerite, had got married for about two years. 
And I kept waiting, Lord, let me go, let me go. And finally, man, we, we moved, and we moved here with nothing. Man, I didn't have a job. All I had was a little S10 truck with the, you know, whatever we owned on top of that little truck. And I remember driving in and just saying, God, we're here. Man, I don't know what you're gonna do, but we're here. I've got a job very quickly. And we, and we, we bought a, a, a house and it was just a miracle that we were able to buy a house because I didn't have a job, right? <laughs> like, how do you buy a house with a job? God, right? So we move into this house and the house had a basement. We were doing Bible studies in my house and as it grew, we started to, to go down to the basement and on Sunday mornings, there'd be like 30 or 40 people in my basement. All the neighbors thought we were a cult. They didn't know what was going on. I remember people would come in and they go, you know what, I'm gonna go to your Bible study but I'm not gonna drink the, the, the juice. <laughs> No communion for me because, you know, they, did, they, didn't, they, thought, they didn't know what was going on. And I remember as we were growing, that grew, we moved from there to a little, little tiny building on Becker Street right across from the water department is now. The, just a little tiny, looked like a box car. And we moved in there. And as we moved into there, within two years, we had to go to two services. And just God was beginning to bless it. I was working a full-time job. And God, God was just adding to the church, man. You know, we're just teaching the Bible Wednesday night and, and Sunday morning, man, just teaching the word of God. As that continued to grow, we're looking now, you know, where are we gonna go? So we would start looking and, and it was about four years later, we moved into a building, 12,000 square feet in real communities. It was an old basketball court. It was where the old La Mesa school used to meet. And we, we started meeting there. And I remember walking in going, God, this is crazy. This is huge. I mean, we'll never be able to outgrow this. Within, within a four more years, man, we were going to three services where there was no parking. And we, we, we were there just going, man, God, I don't know what you're doing. And we've been passing by the Walmart and see the for sale signs out in front of the Walmart going, oh, man, that's crazy. But we put in an offer. And we put an offer that was so ridiculous, I thought there's no way they're gonna take it. It was, it was like $700 a month for 70,000 square feet, right? And we're just thinking, no, I, you know, just we, at least we can say we tried, right? And it was a progressive payment. After the first year, you start paying 2,000 and then you pay 5,000 and then you pay 9,000. You know, we just kind of did this whole progressive thing. After, you know, seven or eight years, we'd be paying what they were asking for it. And the realtor told me, they're never gonna accept this. And I remember going, okay, well, throw it at them, see what they say. And she calls me back. She goes, you're not gonna believe this. They accepted your offer. And I went, oh, no. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just kind of realize, man, what did you just do? And we've been in this building for 18 years now. And... Three years ago, we purchased it, and well, we're, we're paying on it, let's put it that way. And so, man, we've just been blown away, man, what God is doing, how God has changed so many lives, how God is working in so many families. We're just blown away by all the things that God has done over the last, you know, really 26 years since we've been here, but really as a church, probably 24 years as a church that we've been in existence, man. And it's incredible because, you know, it, none of it makes sense. There, there's no logic. There's no, there's no, there's no business plan. There's no, there's no anything that you could have done to say, this is, this is how it happened. It was, all I can say is God has been good and he's been faithful all these years, all these years. He had to teach me faith. He had to teach me to walk by faith. And so what I want to do this morning is, um, I'm gonna show you just, just, a, a, just a picture of what happened last year here at Calvary Chapel, Rio Grande Valley. It's up on the screen, just a short video, uh, just to give you a picture of what, what's happened just last year.
Isn't it awesome? It's hard to believe all of that in, in, in 12 months. And, you know, guys, one of the things that really, as, we, as we're going forward, you know, I've been blown away what God has done up until this point. But now, you know, as we're going forward, man, what does God want to do? You know, what does is, what is God have in store for the Rio Grande Valley in 2019 and beyond? And there's some things that really, you know, what I would consider to be our core principles. You know, I, I remember getting saved, remember studying under Pastor Raul Reese, just learning how to do ministry, just watching God work, and then learning from Pastor Chuck for all those years, man, that Pastor Chuck was, you know, just pouring into the next generation. And so one of the things that, that you know, I want to share with you guys, some very basic principles that we hold to. So you guys know, you know, so that we're one mind and one heart as we're going forward, so that we're, you know, all tracking together. I think it's important, just like a family. You know, any family, you know, I, I know as my kids were growing up, we would have family meetings. We'd get them together and just, you know, talk about, you know, who we are and what we do and why we do it as a family. And so really this first of the year is kind of what I would consider our family meeting. Just kind of talking about the core values that we hold to together as a church. One of the things that we've held to is that Jesus is the center of everything we do. Guys, as a church, really, that, 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 that is, that's why we gather. It's, it's, it's what everything's centered around. It's about him and what he's done and then what he desires to do in everyone's life. And, and really, the reason that we do anything is because of him. There's an incredible passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're taking notes, write that down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. You're welcome to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. And watch what it tells us. Paul writing to the church of Corinth, he says, For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are of a sound mind, it's for you. For it's the love of Christ that compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You see, the love of God is what compels us. And it's the love of Jesus Christ that compels us to do what we do. To serve others, not living for ourselves, but we're living what our lives to love everyone around us and the people that God brings in, you know, in our path and into our church. It's the love of God that needs to be demonstrated to a world that, that's lost and hurting. And so one of, one of the things, if you've been, uh, you know, part of our leadership, you've been part of any of our ministry here at Calvary Chapel, Rural Grand Valley, one of the things that you'll hear over and over again is that we're here to love the people that God brings to us, the love of God. 1 John 4.10, it says this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. The love of God. You see, if God so loved us, he says, we ought to love one another. The greatest compliment I get as a pastor is, is people who are part of our body or those that are visiting our church is that when they walk away from here that they felt loved, welcomed, accepted, cared about. I pray, I pray that that's been your experience here at Calvary Chapel, man, is that you walked in here going, man, those people actually love you. They mean it. And that's what's been kind of our heart, man, from, from 26 years now that we've been here, man, we want people to know that God loves them and we love them. It's the love of God. And I pray that, you know, to the best of our ability, man, we've, we've attempted to share and live and teach and demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. The second thing 
is, that we hold to very dearly here, not only the love of God, but it's the word of God. The word of God is what changes a person's life. So you can sit here and tell you I love you all day long, but you know what? It's God's word that's going to penetrate your heart and awaken you to who God is. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 12, it says this, For the word of God is living and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to of, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's what the scripture says. The word of God is living. It's powerful. It, it reads our mail. It knows what's going on in the depths of us. And the word of God, and we've attempted to create an environment here in the church where people can come and not be distracted and not be, you know, losing their train of thought because people are getting up and coming out and, you know, people are fidgeting. But, you know, that we're here going, man, we're here to hear God's word. We're here to hear God's word. We, we want to hear what God wants to say to us. And we, you know, that's the environment that we've tried to, uh, to, tried to keep here. That's why if you're kind of coming in and out, someone's gonna ask you at the front door, you know what, can you sit in the foyer? Because, you know, going in and out, you're causing distractions for everybody. And together we understand that. That, that we're here with a very specific purpose, man, was to hear the word of God. That's, that's also... You know, that, you know, that we're being sensitive to the people around us because they may be for the first time or maybe God's speaking to them for some specific thing and we don't want to be the thing that would distract them from hearing what God would say to them. So we got to be, you know, sensitive to other people around us. That's love, right? I mean, that, 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 that's, that's caring about others. And so that, that, that's an incredible picture here. I think it's also, you know, why we have our kids' church, our whole children's ministry. We, you know, we have a whole army next door ministering to your kids. And, and, and the reason we do so is so that mom and dad can hear God's word without being distracted and everyone else not being distracted, but also so that your kids can learn at a level that they can understand. Think about that. I feel sorry for every kid that's got to listen to me for 45 minutes. <laughs> Seriously, because, you know, they're just going, oh, man, I wish you'd stop already. And then mom's got to pinch his ear. You know, I mean, something's, I, 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 used, to, I used to be the kid that was there, and get, I'd get pinched every time I had to go to church. Be quiet. Right? And that's really going to help you be quiet. But really, you know, if our kids are learning God's word and they're able to do it at a level that they can comprehend it, man, how much more beneficial is it for our kids? So that they're growing and they're learning God's word. And then everyone that's, you know, here to hear God's word, is, you know, being distracted. And, you know, the kids, I love, love the kids, but, you know, they're, they're hard not to pay attention to. They're so cute, right? They're looking at you and then you want to pinch them and, so you, you know, and not to hurt them, but they're cute little cheeks. But, you know, the whole thing is, is that what? We want an environment where what? We can be attentive to what God wants to say, and the kids can be attentive at their own level to what God wants to say. There's an incredible passage in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. It's kind of been our model. Nehemiah chapter 8, if you would kind of turn there in your Bible. It's an, it's an amazing passage. Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. It tells us there in, in verse one of Nehemiah chapter eight, it says, and all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. Now, the children of Israel had come in, you know, in, back into the promised land, but they were under great distress. And then Nehemiah moves there and they build a wall around the city for the first time after it had been destroyed. And as they're there, you know, finally in a place of safety and security, they were going to gather together now to worship God. For the first time, after many, many years, they hadn't had that ability. And so they all gathered together together. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women. And all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month, then he read from it 
in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men, watch this, and the women and those who could understand and the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. Notice the attention given to. All those who could hear with understanding, you know, those who were able to comprehend were gathered together. And so, you know, Nehemiah, you know, had an incredible, you know, precedent. He had, a, you know, incredible insight here. He says, look, we're going to gather the people who can, get, who can hear and understand so that they can be attentive to what God's saying. And then look at, look at the next verse. I love it, man. Look at verse 4. So Ezra the scribe, he stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for that very purpose, and beside him, and in his right hand stood Methathiah, Shema, and all of his friends. Verse five, <laughs> and Ezra opened the book of the sight of all the people for he was standing above the people and when he opened it, all the people stood up and they blessed the Lord, the great God. Notice when he comes in with the word of God and everyone stands up and what did they begin to do? They began to worship. They're blessing the Lord. Guys, and you know, the moment we, we think about, you know, 25, 30 minutes to worship the Lord before we get into our teaching, and the reason for that is so that we're preparing our hearts to hear from God. So that as, as we're worshiping God, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're connecting with God, we're worshiping him, we're moving our attention, our praise to him, we're blessing him. And as you're doing that, what's happening, man, is that your heart's being prepared so that the word of God, when it goes forth, it's able to, what, to penetrate your heart. You see, our worship time isn't just like our downtime before the study or, you know, time to come and, and kind of wander around or, you know, oh, we got there before the study, we're at church. No, we're here before church so that, what, we're preparing our hearts so we can hear from God so that we're in tune with him, so that we're attentive to the things that he wants to say to us, and then we can worship him and bless him. So our worship time, and I find it interesting that you know, they were blessing the Lord before they ever started reading their Bible. And so they, you know, what an incredible model. Look, look, look what it says in the next verse there. Look at, look at um, it says, all the people answered and said, amen and amen, while lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Oh, the incredible worship service. They were lifting up their hands. They had their, you know, they were bowing their faces. You know, they were, so what? They were in a place of communing with God. And how important that is as a church that we're taking that time to commune with God through our worship. And through that time we were spending with him. And then it tells us in verse 7, watch this. He says, then Beshua and Bani and all the Levites, their friends, helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place so that they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave the sense and they helped them to understand the reading." Notice that what was happening is as, as Ezra was reading the, the, the law, the people didn't understand it. And so what happens? The rest of the guys begin to explain it so at a level that they could understand it. And really, that's what we're doing here on a, on a weekly basis, Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and any other time we're gathering together. It's, you know, I, I, I study for hours to try to you know, God, what do you want to say to us as a church? And then how do I explain it so that everyone can grasp it and understand it and apply it to our lives? That's called expository teaching. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. They were teaching the word of God so that everyone can grasp it and everyone can understand it. And then it tells us in, in this incredible passage, he says, look at verse nine, this is heavy. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep for all the people had wept when they heard the word of the law. What had happened? When the word of God was going forth, it, it what? It penetrated their heart, just like it did my heart and just like it did your heart when you gave your life to Christ. It penetrated their heart and they were weeping, like, man, we've been blowing it. We messed up. You know, what do we do now? And he says, look, don't weep, guys. It's a time to rejoice because God's speaking to you. It's time for, you know, you to be attentive to the things that God's saying. And so it's, a, it's an amazing, I want to encourage you, read Nehemiah chapter 8, it's an amazing chapter, and he just lays out an incredible, I, I think a model 
for us when it comes to worship. And so we have a high emphasis on the teaching of the word of God here. And, I, and, and it's, it's, one, it's one of those core things that, that have been established, man, the love of God, the word of God. Th- those things are, are at our core of who we are as a church family and a church body. There's another principle that I learned very early, man, you know, as a Christian and very early in, in ministry is where God guides, God provides. And I believe that with all of my heart, man, where God guides, God provides. That's why as a church, you know, we, no, no one ever pressures you for money. No one ever tries to guilt you with, for money. And, and I, I believe because, of, because it's a core principle, because it, it, it's really who we are. One of the things that, that I believe ever since we moved here, you know, 26 years ago, if I'm going to teach you to walk by faith, then I got to learn to walk by faith. I can't sit here and tell you to walk by faith when I'm not willing to do it. And so we've walked by faith. For 26 years, man, never, never, if there's a need, I've n- never mentioned that need. Anybody except for missions will tell you, hey, you know, we're going to be doing a missions trip. We're going to be building a church on the mission. You want to give toward it just to make you aware of it. But never, man, never trying to, to put some trip on anybody because this is, what, th- 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 this is the principle that we've lived by. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, and 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this, but this I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also also reap bountifully, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God God isn't looking for us to give out of guilt. He's not looking for us to give out out of manipulation or just because there's a necessity. He wants us to give because we believe who he is and because he's the one who is our provider. That's where giving comes from. It comes from the heart. And I, I'm convinced that giving really is a reflection of your spiritual maturity or your lack of spiritual maturity. That's what it all comes down to. And so really, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we, we've seen over the, the years here at the church is, man, you guys have been so generous as a church, your generosity, man, has blessed this community in more ways than you know. Because one of the things we carry that over into everything we do, you know what, where God guides, God provides, and that we're never gonna be a burden on this community, we wanna bless this community. I mean, if someone comes into these facilities, they wanna use the facility and we're in agreement with you know, what they're doing and, and you know, we, we, we can, we can uh, you know, lock arms with them, we never charge anybody a fee for using our facility because we believe that God gave us freely and we're gonna give freely. Someone has a funeral, man. Someone, I can't tell you how many times I sit down with someone in a funeral and they go, how much is this gonna cost us? It's gonna cost you nothing. It's not gonna cost you nothing. And people just begin to bawl. Why do you guys do that, man? Because we love you. And because this body has been so generous, man, as a church, that we've been able to do that without having to charge anybody anything. We've been able to bless people for weddings and funerals and, you know, every other need. We as a church, man, we don't ask anybody for anything, man. And some people will give because they want to give. Praise the Lord. Give. But not because, you know, I I couldn't do a funeral there because it cost too much money. No, man, we're here to bless others. That's only possible because you guys are giving, because you guys are, are supporting the work. And so, you know, it's incredible, you know, to see, you know, how God has you guys, whether you know it or not, you're blessing this community by your generosity and the things that God has done. And yet, you know, this whole time we know that God is the one who provides. One of the things, as, as another principle, is that you know, we aim to do everything here with integrity. Not perfectly, but we, we've aimed to make everything with, with integrity. We, we, that, that's been our goal. There's three things that Satan has used over the years to take out churches and take out pastors. It's pride, money, and women. Those, those, are, those are the three bullets that Satan has used to try to destroy pastors and try to destroy churches. And so we've had a, you know, a, I, I got an incredible board and, and, and men who that I'm accountable to. 
that, that love me and, I, and, 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 and yet are there to hold me, man, accountable for what I do. I, I need accountability in my own life. I want integrity. When it comes to our finances, man, you know every year we go through a compilation or we go through an audit to make sure that every penny that goes to this church, man, is accounted for. And that we're using it for, for God's glory. And we have you know, many eyes looking at those things to make sure that everything's done with the utmost integrity. Everything. And as, as anyone in, my, in our pastoral staff will tell you, man, that pastors are not allowed to be alone in a room with a woman, counseling with them, or, or, or you know, just because the enemy wants to use that. So we, we put up the barrier. You know, you, could, you meet in a public arena where you're gonna talk with a woman and you only meet with them once. If they're gonna be multiple times, we get a woman to meet with them because we don't ever want, you know, there to be that stumbling block or that area where someone can be tripped up because that's how the enemy works. And so we've always looked at integrity in everything we do, man. There's an incredible you know, thing that started about 10 years ago. We started you know, a, 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 a school here at the church. And I tell you, I, I took a lot of flack, man, just you know, because there's, there's, there's you know, taking kids out of the public school and then bring them to a private school, man, there was, there was, there was some that weren't too favorable, but I, I, this is what I experienced. So many kids that were saying, man, we don't want to go to school anymore because they were not only being bullied, but they were being indoctrinated and they were being knocked down because of their faith. And so we thought, you know, we're going to start a school, man. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna train these kids and that they would be able to, we would be able to deal not just with their body, not just with their, with their, with their, with their soul, but we would be able to deal with their spirit, not just their mind. Not their body, their mind, but their body, their mind, and their spirit. And so what happens, you see, because th- that's something that the public education can never provide. All they can provide is, is, you know, intellect, and all they can provide is, you know, uh, is, you know, sports and, and, you know, being able to do those things, but they can't provide anything spiritually. And so we decided, you know, we're going we're gonna to do a private school, and we're going to try to pour into the next generation of kids so that they have a foundation for their life, man, going forward. And we, we've been blessed, man. Pastor, our, our headmaster, Pastor Sean, man, is just an incredible job, man. And just we're pouring into these kids and then, you know, really wanting to see what God is gonna do over the next years, man, in their lives. Exciting, man, exciting to see what God's doing. Exciting to see all of these kids, man. We've had two graduating classes, three graduating classes, and, we, you know, this year will be our fourth. And, you know, some of these kids are going in, you know, going into the universities and they, they are excelling, it's been amazing just to see what the Lord is doing. And so we, you know, we are wanting to invest into the next generation. And I'm asking you guys to pray. Because, you know, here, here's the deal. We, we, you know, we, we got 160 students next door at, at our school. 160 students. We, we, that's a drop in the bucket. You know, we, we're only influencing, a, a, you know, a, a very small portion of this community. So how do we reach the rest of the community? And we're praying, man, about right around that time, about 10 years ago, when we were starting the school that came up that the land behind us was for sale. There's 13 acres, 12 and a half acres behind us. And so we just like, man, you know, we'd love to get that land. Maybe, maybe we'll build a school there someday. You know, that was just kind of the, the thought. And, and so, you know, here we are, you know, 10 years down the road and we're now looking at and preparing laying out that land so that we can build a facility in the back to see what the Lord will do. Now, you know, we're just at the very beginning stages and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sharing more in the next couple of months. Like I, I, we, we got an architect that's kind of looking at all of this stuff, but I, I just want you guys to know, man, it, it's not gonna be, you know, we're looking at housing the high school there, but we want it to be an area that we're gonna reach the youth of this valley. That's gonna be the heart of it. And so we're gonna, we're praying, man, God, if you're in this, you'll provide we know that. If God wants to do something, man, then he, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna meet the need. But we need to reach this community for the kingdom. That's the heart, man. And we, we, we want to bless our kids and the next generation because if we don't do it, guys, who's going to? 
Seriously. If we as a church don't do it, who's going to do it? And so that's, that's our heart. My aim and my goal for the last 26 years is that Calvary Chapel Rio Grande Valley would be the best fed and the most loved sheep in the world. That's been my heart. And my prayer, man, is that this body it would be a productive body. One of the things Pastor Chuck always told us is healthy sheep will produce healthy sheep. I like that. If you guys are spiritually healthy, then you're gonna reproduce spiritually healthy people. Not just your children, but you're gonna have a burden, what? To reach outside. Your family, your friends, your neighbors. Because you see what God's done in your life, you're gonna wanna share that with others. And so it's been kind of the, you know, the, 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 the philosophy is that, man, we're, our job is to what? Produce healthy sheep. To make sure that you guys are maturing and you're growing in the Lord. And there's something, you know, there's a crisis in our culture right now. We, we, we are at a crossroads as a culture. And, it, and there's a problem that society can't fix and the government can't fix. And the problem is we've abandoned God. That's the problem. Amen. As a culture, we've abandoned God. We've kicked God out of our schools. We've kicked God out of our government. We've kicked God out of our public square. We've kicked God out of every arena. And then we wonder why we're in the state that we're in. And I believe it's a famine that's happening in our nation right now. There's an interesting passage in the book of Amos chapter eight in the 11th verse in Amos chapter eight verse 11 Amos says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. There's a famine going on. And it's the word of God that people are missing and lacking in their life. And our next generation, guys, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Because we're living in a culture, man, that's rejecting God's word. And we have the opportunity to make a difference in the days that we're living in. I don't believe it's a coincidence that I'm living in this day or you're living in this day. I believe God's placed us here for such a time as this. I believe God has put us in this, in this community, in this valley, and you know, in this church, man, because God wants to do something. And really, it comes down to, you know, are we really willing to surrender our lives to him? Do we really want to know him? Are we, really, are we really willing to count, you know, the cost, man, of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? We've got to ask ourselves that question. Seriously. And I, I, have, I have a challenge for us as a church, man. I challenge you to grow in the knowledge of God in 2019. Grow in the knowledge of God. To know what you believe to know what it means to be a Christian. And you may be a Christian for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. You know what? And I know this. I've been walking the Lord 30 years. I can't even believe it. 30 years. And I got to go back and I got to be reminded of those things. I got to go back and say, God, you know, where's my foundation and what am I holding to be true? What does it mean to pray? What does it mean to, to have a devotional life? What does it mean to be in a spiritual battle against the flesh and the spirit? I mean, you know, how, what does all that mean? We're, 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 we're gonna do um, over the next several months and, and it, all of 2019, we're, we're gonna have discipleship classes. We're, 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 we're calling them Know What You Believe is the first set. It's gonna be six weeks long. Know What You Believe. And we're, we're going to take those basic 
foundational things of a Christian life. And then we're, we're going we're to talk about them. We're going to have a little half hour study on them. And then we're going to have dis- discussion groups. We're going to break into groups and we're going we're gonna to just converse. What does it mean? One of the first ones we're going to start, we're, we're going to start this on, on January 31st, Thursday nights, and we're going to do it on Sunday mornings. We're going to do different classes so just, just to make it, you know, accessible to everybody. And, and one of the things we're going to do is, you know, we're, we're going to, the first one is going to be, can we rely on the Bible? Is the Bible trustworthy? And we're going we're to talk about, man, because that's our foundation. You need to know the evidence for the Bible's validity and the Bible's trustworthiness. So that when you get challenged, you're going, no, man, I, I, I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. And then, then from there, we're going to talk about what does it mean to have a prayer life and what does it mean to pray and why do we pray? And we're going to lay out just the whole subject of prayer and then we're going to have groups where we're going to discuss those things together. And my challenge to us, man, is that we would be a church that knows God and we know his word. There's an interesting passage in Hosea chapter four in verse six. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now this is what's interesting. Hosea wasn't writing to the heathen or to the Gentile. He was writing to those those who had been entrusted with God's word. They were supposed to know these things, but they didn't. And he says, my people are destroyed because, for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me. Because you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Wow. Because of what? The generation that disregarded God's word, it affected the next generation. And that's on us, parents. It's on us to know the word of God, to have the knowledge of God, to have the understanding of who God is. Paul would write to the, to the church, uh, to, 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 to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 15, he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then Peter, in 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We gotta be growing in the Lord. You, if you're not growing, you're stagnant. Amen. If you're not growing, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. You can't stand still in your Christian life. You have to continue to grow. And I'll tell you, 30 years later, man, I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I'm still, you know, having this relationship with God through reading his word and through teaching his word. And I, and I love it, man, because I have to do it every day. Every day. You won't know the will of God if you're not in his word. You don't know the heart of God if you're not in his word. You, you can't come from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday and think that somehow you're going to know God or know his will. You're not. It's a relationship with him. And it has, it has to be something that we're growing in and we're maturing in and that we're what, challenging each other in. It's the body of Christ. And so we, you know, we're, 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 we're going we're gonna to do this for six weeks. We're, we're going we're gonna to offer these classes. And we're, we're going to wait until the 31st. And then, uh, you know, we're, on the way out, there's going to be some sign-up sheets. Get your name on there. It was, it was cool. We had a great response first service. I'm expecting to have close to, you know, 20, 30 classes that we're going to be into different groups. And then this, this is what's cool. We're going we're gonna to listen to a study, and then we're going to talk about it. We're going to have some, some questions and answers, and we're going we're gonna to try to challenge each other to grow. We're going to do it for six weeks. We're going to take six topics, and then we're going to take a break for four weeks, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk not, not just knowing what you believe, but now practicing what you believe. And then we're going we're gonna to do six weeks of that, and then we'll take a little three, four-week break, and then we're going to come back and look at doctrines of the Bible, and we're going to look at that. So that what happens, man, over the next year, 2019, man, my prayer is that all of us would grow in our walk with the Lord and our knowledge of God. That's that's the goal. And I I challenge you guys, man, to to get plugged in into one of those classes. 
challenge every one of you, whether you've been a Christian for a long time or a little time. If you've been a Christian for a long time, then come and pour into those that are new in the Lord. Come and, and you know, be a resource. Help answer questions. You know, walk alongside those that are not as mature so that all of us together, man, could grow together and see what God wants to do. That's my first challenge to you. My second challenge is that you get involved serving the Lord. I think sometimes you walk around, you see everything happening, you go, man, everything's taken care of, everything's covered, you know, th- there's no needs. Let me, let me tell you something. We, ha- we, we can use 100 servants tomorrow. Our children's ministry is busting out. We, we need more people just walking in the hallways, just, just, just answering questions, people just, you know, assisting the teachers, teachers. We, we, you know, th- there's so many places, greeters and ushers. There's so many areas to serve. And, and I, I would just encourage you, you know, part of your Christian life is using your gifts. And if you're not going to use your gifts, then you're not going to grow. You won't. If you're not gonna use the gifts that God has entrusted to you, then you'll become stagnant in your Christian life. God's given you gifts, Christian. I can't wait to get to 1 Corinthians, man. You know, when you get to 12, 13, and 14, and 15, man, incredible, because he talks about the body and how the body functions. And so we'll be looking at that in the next months, man, as we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Incredible, incredible. Right, someone said, Christianity is a contact sport. I like that. It's not a spectator sport. <laughs> you got to get in and you got you to you you know, you serve, you got to grow. You got to bless others. I love uh, the, the story of, of Robert J. Morgan. He told this story. Um, Robert J. Morgan told the story of a preacher who was approached by a man who wanted to join the church. And the man said, I have a very busy schedule. I can't be called on for any service like committee work, teaching, or such things. I just won't be available for such projects or or to help with setting up chairs or things like that. I just want to sit through Sunday worship and I want to go about my business. The minister thought for a moment and he replied, I believe you're at the wrong church, sir. The church you're looking for is three blocks down the street on the right. The man followed the preacher's directions and he soon came to an abandoned, boarded up, closed down church building. It was a dead church, gone out of business. (laughs) What a picture. Guys, if the body doesn't do the work of serving others and blessing others, man, then the church can't function the way God intended it to. It can't. And every one of us have a part. All of us have to do our share. Every one of us, me, you, everybody in the church, if this is your church. And so, you know, I, I, my, my encouragement, you know, as we're looking at this new year and just, I mean, I'm blown away what God is doing. I'm blown away what God has done. I, I can't wait to see what the Lord has in store. But you know what? We have to keep growing as a church. We have to keep growing individually. And then we have to serve others. And my challenge, man, as we go into 2019, man, is that we're growing in the knowledge of God and that we're serving the Lord. And, and I pray you would take me up on that. There's an, a, a cool, a cool uh, passage in, in Colossians chapter one. And I'm asking everyone, turn there. Colossians chapter one. Look, look, look at verse nine with me. This was the prayer that Paul was praying for the church of Colossae, Colossians 1.9. And that's a prayer that, um, that I'm, I'm praying for you and for our church. Watch what that prayer is, Colossians 1.9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and in spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful, watch this, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's our goal, guys. That's our prayer. That's our prayer. 
is that we would be fruitful in the work that we're doing and we'd be increasing in the knowledge of God as we're doing it. And that God would accomplish in your life and in my life, man, an incredible, you know, I, I, was, I, I meet with all of our deacons before uh, Sunday morning at se- seven o'clock. We get together and we pray for you guys. We pray for the church. And I was sharing with them, you know, just kind of what I was sharing this morning. And I said, you know what, guys, here, here's the deal. I, 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 I don't, I want, I want to finish this race, man. And I, I, I don't want to leave anything on the table. I, I want to go for it, man. I want to see what God wants to do. And my prayer, man, is that as we're going forward, man, and we're seeing what God wants to do, that you would also have that heart too. Let's see what God wants to do. I don't, I, I don't want to get to the end of my life and go, man, what if, or what, you know, I could have or should have. I, I want to get to the end of my life and say, man, I laid it on the, on the table. That I poured out my life, man, for the things that are eternal and the things that count, because I'm not taking any of this with me, and neither are you. The only thing you're gonna have, man, is the things that you stored in heaven, everything else is gonna burn. And if we believe that, man, then we should be living it out, and acting out, man, how do we bless this community, this valley, our families, you know, how, how do we minister, man, to the next generation, so that we leave a legacy, man, I wanna leave a legacy. Not, 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 not that, you know, it, it has any, that a legacy that people would know that the love of God and the power of God is real. And I want that legacy to be established in this Rio Grande Valley. And man, in your life and in my life. Amen.